We've made it to chapter six of 1 Timothy. If you are jumping in here at chapter six, I do encourage you to go and watch some of the previous videos just to help give you some context from what we've seen in the book of 1 Timothy so far. The sermon that I preached from this section I called Truth Shaped Service. Paul has spoken much about the truth of the gospel throughout this letter so far. It's the truth about salvation through Jesus. God our Savior wants all people to be saved. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. The salvation of sinners is the heartbeat of this whole letter of 1 Timothy. Uh, we saw at the end of chapter 3 that as God's household, God's people, we are meant to hold that truth up high for the world to see. And in this section, we see how that looks within the slave-master relationship. And this has implications into our working environments in today's world. If you haven't already done so, I encourage you to take some time, read through this a short passage just a couple of times, familiarize yourself with it, uh, spend some time praying, asking God to help you to understand his truth, because this is God speaking through his word to us. And I'm going to highlight just some of what I've seen in this passage. As I said, there are two uh, characters or subjects within uh, this passage. So it's those who are under slavery. Um, so slaves and masters. So Paul focusing on the slave-master relationship. In verse 1 here, he seems to be speaking about uh, slaves and masters in general, whether those masters are believing or not. In verse 2, he's focusing specifically on slaves who are Christian slaves working under Christian masters, believing masters. And he has specific things he wants to tell those slaves. Something we've seen since chapter 1 of 1 Timothy is that false teachers, false teaching was coming into this church and was undermining the truth of the gospel. And so Paul here in addressing the slave-master relationship is also addressing some of the false teaching that may have come in and it seems like some of the slaves were being taught or being led to think that because they were now Christian slaves they didn't need to serve their Christian masters as well and Paul is addressing that topic in this section. Just to help us a little bit with structure in this section, uh, in Paul's letters it's always worth looking out for imperatives. So imperatives are commands or verbs that are commands and there are two imperatives in this section so slaves should consider their masters they consider your master worthy of respect that's the, the imperative the command and then the second command don't show them less respect uh, it's a command and these imperatives are on either side of what is the technical term for the verb is a subjunctive. And that's just a fancy word for saying this is a verb that gives purpose. So we've got these two imperatives um, on either side of a purpose. And the purpose in all of this is so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. So Paul wants this slave-master relationship to be worked out in such a way that God's name and the teaching of the gospel is held high rather than slandered or blasphemed. So structurally, uh, we see this so that giving the purpose for the section. And flowing out of what we saw in the previous uh, two sections, they are linked together by the idea of respect or honor. So this is worthy of all honor. And we've already seen this in uh, chapter 5, verse 3, where widows were to be honored. And then in 5, verse 17, the elders are worthy of double honor. So widows honored, elders double honored. Slaves, your masters are worthy of all honor, kind of growing. Honor the widows, double honor, all honor. And in those relationships, the, the honor shown to those different uh, people is all part of us holding up the truth that salvation through Jesus actually does something. So Paul is speaking to slaves here and saying, slaves, you want to work 
really, really well in a way that holds up the truth of your salvation to the watching world. Now, if you're teaching this to a group, you may have some in the group who just see this word slavery and it almost makes them want to write this off. How could the Bible even speak about slavery without writing it off as the awful thing that it is? In speaking about slavery here, and in many of Paul's other letters in Colossians and his earlier letter to Ephesians, in uh, Titus, in the whole book of Philemon is about a slave-master relationship. Paul speaking about this topic of slavery is not Paul condoning it, but rather he's giving God's wisdom of how to live out that slave-master relationship within a fallen world, in a way that's glorifying to God. Now, it's estimated that there were about 50 to 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. So this is a very important topic. For us living in South Africa, that is like the whole population of our country uh, as slaves. It's a lot of slaves. In Ephesus, probably about a third of the city would have been slaves. But slaves in this day could have been things like teachers or artisans or uh, just workers in general in fields or, or different crafts. It wasn't like the African slave trade or the human trafficking that we see in our world today still, which is an absolute abomination. Although slavery isn't something that God condones in his world, it is something that he gives wisdom on how to live out that relationship. And for these slaves, they were very much like our uh, workers in the world today. Yes, there were some who were treated incredibly badly, but many slaves were in that position because it gave them stability and uh, security. Some slaves even had slaves of their own. But even that we've seen earlier in chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, where Paul is speaking about uh, different ungodly practices among the murderers and the sexually immoral, he does mention slave traders as those who are um, ungodly sinners. So slavery was not something that was condoned. Um, slave traders was uh, part of the ungodly practices in their world, but Paul is regulating, helping slaves to know how to live out this relationship within a broken world. And in doing this, his big aim, as, we, as we've seen, the purpose is so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. See, a slandered church loses its gospel power. This same uh, Greek word for slandered is used in the Septuagint, so the um, Greek translation of the Old Testament in Isaiah 52 verse 5 where God's name was being dishonored among the Gentiles, was being slandered among the Gentiles because of the behavior of God's people who had turned away from him. And Paul is saying God's name and the glorious teaching of the gospel should never be slandered because of the way that slaves work or treat their masters. And for us in our day, we need to think, so we don't want God's name or the teaching of the gospel to be slandered by the way that we go about our day-to-day -day work, wherever that may be, whether it's in a workplace or in a school or even the work that we are called to do in our homes. We want God's name to be held high and the teaching of the gospel to be held high by the way we work. But now in verse 2, Paul focuses in on the relationship between uh, Christian slaves and Christian masters, believing masters. And he says, yes, they are brothers. In Christ, um, we are in a whole new sphere of relationship. But just because those believing masters are brothers in Christ doesn't mean that you show them less respect. That's an imperative. It's a command. Don't show them less respect. And this is something that we could easily uh, fall into. There are certain things, if you're working for a Christian boss as a Christian, you could excuse certain behaviors and say, oh, he'll understand. I'm doing this um, good thing in my church, which is robbing a bit of time from me in my workplace, but my boss is a Christian, he'll understand. 
or just thinking, well, he's a Christian, he'll forgive me, even if I don't work as well as I could possibly have worked. And Paul is driving into that and he's saying, instead, serve them even better. Even better. Because those who benefit from their service are believers, brothers, and are dear to them. So they are believers and they are beloved. So for us coming to this and we see this slave-master relationship, we mustn't write it off and say, well, it doesn't speak to us because I'm not a slave in that kind of way. If you are under the yoke, serving under someone, as somebody who's your master, whether it be your boss or a school teacher or principal, um, if you're a child in the home, uh, under your parents, the chores they give you to do even, this has implications into all of those different spheres. You want to do what you are doing, considering those who are over you as worthy of all honor, full respect. Why? So that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. To put that positively, so that God's name and our teaching may be held high. That's what Paul called them to do at the end of chapter 3. And then he's saying specifically for those who have believing masters, show them even more respect because they are family. Serve them even better. In Paul's earlier letter to these Christians in Ephesus, he had spelt this out even further. So if you go and look at Ephesians 6, uh, verse 5 and 6, we see that Paul says that slaves should obey their earthly masters just as you would obey Christ. And then he calls them slaves of Christ. So all of us might say, well, I'm not a slave. But what Paul teaches us is that we have actually been freed from slavery to sin and death. But we've been freed from that slavery and been moved into slavery to Christ, which is actually perfect freedom. If you go and read what Paul teaches further on that. Being a slave of Christ is the best possible place that you can be in. And just as Christ, our Savior, has served us, Paul says, serve. Serve your Christian masters even better. Consider whoever your master is as worthy of full respect, all so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered, so that the truth about Jesus might be held high for all the world to see. And so, as you think further about this as you teach it to others it's worth us thinking about the different spheres in which we are occupied day by day our workplaces for most people are the place where you'll interact most with unbelievers and god our savior wants all people to be saved that includes the people in your workplace and so you want god's name and the teaching about salvation through jesus to be held high by the way you work working for your masters in a way worthy of full, showing them full respect, um, serving them even better, also that God might be glorified through your work and so that sinners might be saved by Jesus. So think practically about what this uh, might look like within your own context and pray that God might help you uh, to be someone who serves, who works in a way that lifts his name high and holds out the truth of salvation through Jesus and shows that it actually does something. Well, God bless as you dig in further.